there are two scriptures which uh, you have on your list of the lectures. Uh, I'm going to read them both in reverse order. So the first one is Ephesians 4 verse 32. I'm going to read the verse from the New Translation by J.N. Darby. Be to one another kind, compassionate, forgiving one another, so as God also in Christ has forgiven you. The second scripture is in Colossians, Colossians chapter 3 verses 12 and 13. I'm actually going to read verses 14 and 15 as well because those four verses together um, form what appears to be a paragraph in the epistle. So Colossians 3 verses 12 to 15. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any should have a complaint against any, even as the Christ has forgiven you, so also do ye. And to all these add love, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of Christ preside in your hearts, to which also ye have been called in one body, and be ye thankful. Thus far the word of God. Our subject is forgiveness. The first scripture we read brings before us God's forgiveness and what it should produce in us. The second takes up the same theme, but perhaps looked at from a slightly different standpoint. These two scriptures are not repetition. They're both given to bring before us different views of what really is a vast subject. When I, when I was asked to take this section, I, I asked myself, who are you to talk to your brethren about forgiveness? Then I thought again, and I thought, well, for a start, you've been forgiven. And for another, it's not my standard of forgiveness or yours. The subject rests on what God has done. We need to lose sight of the speaker and just look at the end of the verse, Ephesians 4, verse 32. The, those few words reveal so much. God has forgiven us. Let's pause there. Can everyone who's listening to me now say for a certainty that God has forgiven them? Because that is our starting point. If we cannot all say that, then anyone who can't say it, what I'm going to say is not really going to make too much sense. It has, I hope it will make sense, but it won't be meaningful to you. The Apostle Paul told the Ephesians, this letter written to the Ephesian assembly, he told them on the last occasion when he met with the Ephesian elders, he told them that he had preached repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That is Acts 20, verse 21. Those two things secure forgiveness. Forgiveness is the start of the Christian life. Faith in God, peace with God follows. Read the end of R Romans chapter four, the beginning of Romans chapter 
five. But our God is a forgiving God. But he's a savior God, a savior God. This expression, I suppose, really, we, we, we get in the, in the New Testament. Um, as far as I can, I can see, um, uh, we find it in Paul's epistles because we now have God's full revelation on the subject of forgiveness. But now that we have the picture in full, doesn't mean that the picture has changed. Our God is the same. If we look back, we see that as soon as Adam sinned, we hear the words, Adam, where art thou? God would not leave Adam and Eve in that eternal banishment from himself, which would have followed their failure. God would not leave them to that, to what was before them. And I'm going to borrow the words of one who one might not expect to be able to speak the mind of God. In circumstances where one would not expect to find prophecy. But the words are so apt for the basic truth I'm getting across. I'm encouraged. Because our brother Emil this afternoon quoted the first, the opening of that verse. Uh, and I'm going to read the whole verse. It's 2 Samuel 14, verse 14. For we must needs die and are as water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth God respect any person, yet doth he devise means that his banished be not expelled from him. Yet doth he devise means that his banished be not expelled from him. And as we go all through the scriptures, we see again and again that re God reaches out to man in every age and every dispensation. Come, let us reason together, says Jehovah. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 1 verse 18. And in the New Testament, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, verse 21. The fulfillment of this purpose of God depends upon Christ. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4 verse 10. Our God is a savior God. I'll say it again. He is called a savior God five times in the epistle to Titus alone. And something like 14 more times in other scriptures. It's notable, I think, that five times it occurs in the epistle to Titus. Titus was working in Crete. And Cretans were not, humanly speaking, very nice people. You can read what the apostle says about them. Liars, evil beasts, lazy, gluttonous. That's their description as natural men. And yet our saviour God had made himself known to such as those. And they had become saints. And they were going on. And they're being exhorted to adorn the doctrine. This is the extent 
to which God can save man from the degradation into which naturally he falls. Now, you'll notice that I read the, uh, the Jay and Darby version of this, and I did so for a very good reason. Our authorized, uh, our authorized version rather changes the language. It talks about God for Christ's sake has forgiven us. Now, that may be right, but it can be misleading. Mr. Darby, along with most other reputable versions of the scriptures, or should I say most other reputable translations of the scriptures, um, refers to God or God in Christ forgiving us. The idea that there's been some kind of difference or some kind of adjustment on the part of God to forgiving us is quite wrong and misleading because it, um, it's not, it, it, it's um, uh, this idea, it's often voiced by, uh, by um, or held subconsciously that somehow Christ has persuaded God to change his mind about us. Now that is quite wrong. The purpose of God was to forgive, that his banished be not expelled. The same God who said, let us three persons make man in our own image, purposed re redemption before the foundation of the world. And it was Christ who accomplished that redemption in order that there might be forgiveness. God is three persons and God is one. One of our hymns, I think it's number 14, says all the mind in heaven is one. And with regard to salvation, forgiveness, read Luke 15. You'll have noticed, won't you, the three parts of what is described as a parable. This parable, but there are actually three parts, but it's all one parable. See there pictured the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The mind is one. We read that the Son of Man had power on earth to forgive sins, but the Son of Man is the Son of God. The Father has committed all judgment to the Son, and faith in Christ brings everlasting life. John 5:24 freedom from condemnation he can say to the sinner uh, who believes and so in our verse god has forgiveness in christ these verses don't actually recount the cost of that forgiveness we read of that elsewhere in fact in that very chapter uh, not sorry not in that chapter in ephesians 1 7 and in colossians 1 14 tell us that this is achieved only by blood the cost is not um, mentioned in our verse and i'm not going to speak about the cost this evening but you know there's another hymn i'm going to quote no act of power could e'er atone no wonder working word could from the brightness of the throne make love's sweet voice be heard if sinners ever were to know the depths of love divine all calvary's weakness and its woe blessed savior must be thine 359 i think is the number but god has completely forgiven us psalm 103 verse 12 as far as the east is from the west so far hath he removed our transgressions from us our sins are we might say behind his back he doesn't remember them we can't say that he's forgotten them but he doesn't remember them and nor should we if we know we've been forgiven and believe it 
we leave it there. Now, this complete forgiveness that God grants to everyone who trusts him is the measure to which we're called to forgive. Last month, our brother David Daisley spoke to us on Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. Now, you, you know, don't you, that in the, in the original text, there is, no, uh, there is no division into chapters. So those two verses follow on our verse. And they, they, they follow a thought through. And I think our brother said that um, forgiveness forms a main part of our walk as Christians. And verse 32 and verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5 uh, tell us to be followers of God as dear children and to walk in love. Now, you see now the connection between verse 2 and chapter 4, verse 32, where we're exhorted to be kind, compassionate, and forgiven, forgiving. The motive must be love. This is part of the latter part of the epistle to the Ephesians where we're told to walk worthy of our calling. And that means by definition that we treat one another as fellow saints, part of one body. Therefore, we need to be kind to one another, tender hearted. We love the others who are a part of this circle of truth. And we forgive them because we love them. The Lord Jesus told his disciples to forgive those that trespassed against them. And he took away the limits of that forgiveness. Think of Matthew chapter 18, where Peter said to him, Lord, how often do I have to forgive my brother? Is it seven times or is it 70 times? And the Lord said, no, it's 70 times seven. In other words, there is no limit. There is no limit to which we have, um, in, there is no limit in which we have been forgiven. And we are told to forgive as we have been forgiven. That is a high standard. How can we possibly meet it? Well, I think the answer comes earlier in chapter four. Um, like those to whom the apostle is writing, we have a new nature. Our sins have been forgiven. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Another comment that our brother uh, mentioned last, last week, he said, um, um, love is being under the influence of himself. Well, now that ties in with the new nature, does it not? in chapter four of Ephesians. Love is, well, it's been shed abroad in our heart, is not a gift of the Holy Spirit, it is a way. Um, that is very clear if you read the epistle to the, the Corinthians. In chapter 12 the, of the first epistle, the apostle lists, lists um, a great number of spiritual gifts. And at the end, he says, yet yeah, I show you a more excellent way. And then he goes on in chapter 13 to speak about love. So love is a way of life. Love in action. So how can we measure up to that? I think we go to verses 21 and 24 of chapter 4 of Ephesians. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind.
which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. There it is, the new man, putting off, putting on. We have that new nature. The old man can't forgive, it's just not in him. But the new man has this new nature and we have to put it on as a complete thing. And it is in that condition that the link between love and forgiveness can be realized. If I put on Christ, I shall become kind, compassionate, forgiving, and it will be himself coming out in me. And this is what this verse is, is, is telling me. There's also the work of the Holy Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3.18, Transform, transforming us into the image of Christ. So now let's look at some incidents where Christ is our example in forgiveness. In John chapter 8, we have the incident of a woman taken in adultery. Now, without doubt, this was a sin. But the Lord showed us by his challenge to her accusers that none of them were in a position to condemn her. Lesson one, let's be slow to condemn the sins of others. More surprisingly, he said to her, neither do I condemn thee, go, go and sin no more. That doesn't mean the sin was forgiven but it was made clear that she was not to continue in that line of things. Lesson two, recovery. Now, when, we're when I'm talking about forgiveness, I do not mean that it's within our power to forgive sins. What we're talking about is forgiving trespasses or offenses against ourselves. Only God forgives sins. But I'm using that as an illustration of our attitude to those who have offended us. Readiness to forgive. A woman that was a sinner and she was known generally for what she was. And yet the Lord honored her true repentance. Upon the cross, one thief confessed the name of the Lord Jesus. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Immediate forgiveness, immediate salvation, immediate promise. And then there was anticipatory forgiveness. This was mentioned in passing this afternoon. The Lord, that, that Peter, when Peter but even before Peter failed the Lord Jesus, he, the Lord Jesus said to him, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. These are what the Lord Jesus said to Peter. And we can pray for strength for our brethren. Father, forgive them, the Lord Jesus prayed later. Sorry, earlier on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I used to wonder why the Lord Jesus prayed like that. But of course it was that that would be forgiven the Jewish nation, that they might have an opportunity, the first opportunity, the very first time the gospel of the grace of God was preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost. It was preached to those who had put the Lord Jesus to death and those who had witnessed it and those who had been there on that day, as well as others who had come together. That was the reason the Lord Jesus prayed that way. It opened up a way by which Jews who rejected the Lord Jesus could hear first the gospel of the grace of God but with the Lord Jesus, there was no compromise of God's name or glory. 
the one who found time for those who sought him would not do, tolerate dishonor to the temple of God as it was at that time. Now, before we pass on, let's think what forgiveness means. Um, it's not the same as tolerance. We hear a lot about tolerance today. I looked up in the dictionary what, it's, what it says forgiveness actually means. And what I read was to pardon, to overlook, to pardon a debt or offense, to give up, to show mercy or compassion, or give a pardon. So to forgive is not to ignore or overlook what is wrong, but it's to remit the offense which has been committed. Now, I think we can understand that in relation to when we should forgive someone who we believe has offended us. So who are we to forgive? Well, the Lord Jesus taught his disciples uh, to pray and he spoke of remitting the sins of those that were indebted to them. And uh, the word in the authorized version, it says trespasses. Now, trespasses there is not the same as the trespass offering in the Old Testament. The word trespass that's used in that setting, what's commonly called the Lord's Prayer, but it was when the Lord was teaching his disciples to pray. That word that's translated trespasses really means to miss the mark. It's a shortcoming. It's a shortcoming in somebody else that we're called to forgive. And I hope that helps with what we're being told to give, to forgive. It's something which has given us personally uh, a sense of grievance. It may or may not be a, a sin on the part of that other person. So let's summarize what we've been considering before we move on to Colossians. In Ephesians, we are looked at as possessing every spiritual blessing in Christ. As such, we're citizens of heaven on earth who are called to work, walk worthy of their calling. This means putting off the old and putting on the new. The new nature must find its expression in love and forgiveness. The new man is formed after Christ and the behavior follows. It must be in accord with the way that Christ walked here below. In both epistles, the word renewed is used. This does not mean that the old nature has been um, reconditioned, improved. Um, how to explain it? it, it it's the, the new nature living and active in the believer. His body is unchanged, but his purpose, his motive, his object is completely different. Therefore, he's able to carry out what he's exhorted to do in Romans 12, 1, which is to present his body um, as a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Uh, that is what the renewed nature does. Now, in Colossians, we read those verses in Colossians. In Colossians, we have died with Christ and risen with him. That's why I say the perspective is slightly different. We've died with Christ and we've risen with him. He is our head in heaven and we are his body on earth. And as such, we're exhorted at the beginning of chapter three to do two things. Seek the things which are above, where Christ is at the right hand of God. And verse five, to mortify our members which are on earth. Now. 
the, the verses we read, verses 12 and 13, and indeed 14 and 15, fit into that picture. Seeking the things which are above, mortifying the members on earth. Seeking the good of our brethren, not criticizing them, forgiving them if it's needed. Again, it refers to putting off the old and putting on the new. Uh, and I think perhaps in Colossians, in this chapter, we're more conscious of our um, earthly bodies than we are perhaps in Ephesians. We have physical bodies and uh, members. What has changed for the believer is his nature within, not the outward body in which the soul and the spirit live now the things he puts on in verses 12 and 13 don't involve outward display they spring out of the new nature within uh, verse 12 we read uh, the positive moral qualities of christ bowels of compassion kindness lowliness meekness long-suffering They were seen and witnessed in the Lord Jesus while he was here below, no doubt. But these are features of him, not dependent on whether he's on earth or where he is. These are essential, among the essential moral qualities of our Lord and Saviour. They show the inward moral feelings of the Lord. He is the one in whom all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily, according to chapter 2, verse 9. But at the same time, he is all and in all to his own, verse 11 of chapter 3. Now, is he all in all to us? Because Christ is the perfection of what God looks for in man. And so verse 12 brings before us the question of how far he is all in all to me, to you, to all of us. How far? Only to the extent that he is can we feel and walk in the way that the Lord Jesus once walked here. These are challenging verses. Verse 13 brings before us forgiveness. Perhaps we might call again that, uh, recall again that uh, chapter in Matthew 18, I forgave thee all that debt. Verse 32 of Matthew 18. So if we're forgiven, what place does complaining to or about each other have with us the old nature does nothing else but sadly it shows itself so often among believers perhaps it's not that we find brethren our brethren to be at such serious fault that we can't uh, bear with them but little things irritate i have to confess i tend to be impatient and little things can so easily irritate we can all think of examples i was going to give some examples and i think it's better not to but if we allowed to, ourselves to be upset by these things we actually sink to the level of the one we consider to be at fault. As I read this verse, if any should have a complaint against any, even as Christ has forgiven you, so do ye. 
I, I think back to Joseph in the Old Testament. His words to his brethren when he sent them back to, to his father in, in Genesis 45, verse 24, he said, don't quarrel all the way. Now, just consider the circumstances of that for a moment. He'd shown himself to them. He'd revealed himself to his 11 brethren. He'd forgiven them for what they, for their betrayal of him, for their treatment of him. He'd embraced them in love. He'd given them provisions for the way. He'd given them changes of clothing and good things. And he'd asked them to tell his father of all his glory in Egypt. Now, we too are forgiven. We're on our way to the Father's house. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ. And surely we know something of the glory of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet these verses, I think, gently teach us too not to quarrel on the way. Verse 14 bids us to add love to these qualities. It's found in Christ and in those who are his because it's the bond of perfectness. And we come again to the vital connection between love and forgiveness and these exhortations. And without that love, that better way, we are sounding brass. Verse 15 brings in the peace of God. Do you see how the picture builds up? We're called to let it preside in us. It's a garrison of our hearts, according to Philippians 4, 7. But also it's an active thing in us, or it should be, according to this passage. In the believer to whom Christ is all, the peace of Christ affects his actions and attitude towards his fellow believers. Together they can share that perfect peace which the Lord promised. More than promised, he gave it to his own, John 14, 27. Forgiveness is the start. Without it, there can be no peace. And the picture here is a company of Christians, forgiven and forgiving, together enjoying the true fellowship and peaceful conditions among themselves. Christ their object and Christ their purpose. Is that impossible for us in the 21st century? Uh, far more than Joseph's provisions for his brethren, we have everything we need until the Lord Jesus comes again. And the Holy Spirit within each one of us longs to present us blameless to Christ. Note the mention of the calling in one body. I think what is in view here is not only my or your local meeting, but the whole company of saints. If we truly followed through these verses, how slow we should be to promote disharmony among God's people. How much more ready we should be to look first for forgiveness and restoration. Not I'm not speaking about the discipline of God's house. Of course, that is necessary. And nothing in scripture negates that. What I'm speaking about is keeping the unity of the spirit. And I think these verses challenge us as to how far we have had this before us in considering matters of fellowship and association. Now, that subject is important, but it's beyond our subject this evening, and I'm not going to go there. Um, there's not time, but it's not suitable for this occasion.
what I want to leave with you is the thought of keeping before ourselves the picture of a gathering of God's people on earth owning the head in heaven but that truly shows love one towards another knows something of the peace of Christ and that we've been called in one body may the Lord Jesus Christ help us all to forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven us.